this is, this is, this is. Early morning coming at you, Monday, May 13th, 509, episode 509. 509. I don't know. Is that a cleaning product? What why do I why is that stick in my head? All these numbers always I always think of a number and what it pertains to in my life. 509. That's uh pretty sure that's a cleaning brand. Um anyway, that's not why we're here people. We're here to talk about your voicemails. I love when you come in, you call in, you ask me questions, you talk about the shows you've been to, you want to talk about songwriting, whatever that is, you know, <clears throat> relationships, job advice, whatever it is, I got you covered. I've been through, not at all, I haven't been through every sort of situation, but I I feel like I've been through a lot. I've, I've traveled the world, I've met a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people. So come on, bring it, bring it on. The number is 360-830-6660. Three minute time limit on the voicemail, so know what you're gonna say, have it prepared and give us a call some of these uh date back to like our philly show and i haven't listened to these but <clears throat> we're going to get right into it thanks for your calls mxpx is going to be playing bremerton washington our hometown june 28th and 29th the shows are sold out thank you we'll be at the admiral theater with the ataris um two nights and then that sunday J- uh, june 30th mxpx is going to be playing with no effects in portland so we're main support for them we go on right before they play and that's sunday night in portland all right it's going to be a great weekend before that actually before that end of june weekend goldfinger fans are going to be happy if you're in denver if you're somewhere near and you can fly in because denver is doing a ska fest and it's goldfinger and less than jake a bunch of bands five iron frenzy is going to be there uh it's going to be awesome so that is the weekend of June fourteenth, fifteenth. Uh, pretty sure we play we play that Saturday. Anyway, I'm playing that show. I'll be on base. We'll see you in Denver. Uh, okay, the rest of the shows we got um, announced for MXPX. We're playing with No Effects in Denver again. What is it with Denver? MXPX is, was just in Denver. Uh, Den, uh, Goldfinger's coming to Denver. MXPX is coming back to Denver with no effects. I, I love you, Denver. I love you, apparently. So I'll see you again with MXPX July 20th in Denver with no effects. Um, and then October, somewhere in there, I don't know the dates. I always forget the dates, but somewhere October, the very final weekend of no effects, MXPX will be down in San Pedro, California, the Los Angeles area. Um, mxpx.com, a bunch of new merch. We have, uh, we, we always put, um, we, we have a new merch every single show we do. There's something new, something. So, uh, any leftovers from shows, those end up at mxpx.com. We have variants of our new album, Find a Way Home. If you haven't already listened to that, please do. All right. I'll stop blabbing. I just, I just had to tell you. Um, shout out to Bob McKnight for uh, submitting a song. He didn't even submit last week, but we had Music Monday. If you haven't already listened to last week's episode, uh, you can submit your your favorite song, your favorite band um, that needs more love, that people haven't heard about. It's really meant to be for younger, or not younger, I, I didn't mean to be ageist. It's meant to be for up and coming independent artists, bands, people that need help pr- promoting um, you know, whatever that is. So don't send me like a Smashing Pumpkins song. Not that I don't like uh, Breakdown 1979. I like that song, but we don't need to hear that on this show. So it's all about finding bands and songs that you really feel like people haven't heard enough of. Submit those. And if it's you, and, and mostly it's people submitting their own bands, which is great because I want the community to hear other people in our community. Um, so go to the Mike Herrera podcast Facebook group on Facebook. It's a private group. If you're not part of it, you can join for free and submit a YouTube link of your favorite song by your favorite local or up and coming band or your band. Uh, that's for Music Mondays. Um, we're getting plenty of, of uh, submissions, but I just wanted to put the information out there for people wondering how to do it. All right. 
So your voicemails, love it. I love hearing all about it. I love hearing your stories from the shows, like I was saying earlier. So let's get into some voicemails today, and um, we'll hear from you. Again, if you want to call in, call in uh, 360-830-6660. All right, here is the first voicemail. Hey, Mike. Uh, first time calling in. My name is Steve. I live in Jersey. And I have uh, been a big fan of yours ever since I was uh, 15 when I came across uh, Life in General as a freshman in high school, which is nearly 30 years ago, so that's crazy. Anyway, I've seen MXPX a few times, uh, Irving Plaza, New York, a couple warp Tours, but uh, not in a very long time, up until last Saturday in Philly with the Ataris. Such an awesome show, man, really. Love the set list, the energy from you, Tom, Yuri, and Chris. But I swear, man, you personally have such an amazing stage presence. The way you carry the flow and add your thoughts, amp the crowd. Love what you guys did with GSF. Just such an awesome experience. I brought my wife to the show. We've known each other since the late 90s, so she's heard way enough uh, MXPX in my car over the years to become a fan herself. And now even my eight-year-old son is becoming a fan. Anyway, just bought tickets to see you with uh, Goldfinger in Atlantic City in April, hoping to uh, get a chance to maybe meet and say what's up. We were too tired to and had too long of a drive ahead to stick around in Philly to meet, but, you know, old people problems. Anyway, just wanted to call in and say thank you, man. Keep it up. Loving the new music, and uh, never came across your podcast before, but uh, I'll, I'll be listening now. Be in April. Rad. Dude, thanks for calling. What's up, Steve? Jersey, thanks for coming out from Jersey. Uh, Philly was so much fun. We had a great time. Um, all these shows, honestly, have been a blast. Every single show has something unique about it, has something to write home about, and um, whether it's you know guest vocalists or something that happens in the crowd or, you know, whatever on stage. Uh, it's been going great. Um, technically, the crew has been getting better and better as we go. You know, we started out, really, we started out this tour in Seattle um, last year. Uh, we did basically what was more or less basically a, a New Year's Eve show, but it was on New Year's Eve Eve. We always do stuff like that, the Eve Eve of something, but <clears throat> we had a blast. And that sort of kicked off the, you know, doing the club shows, theater shows uh, here with this album. And and we had, up until then, we hadn't done like a headlining show up until Seattle. So when we, when we were, when the album came out, we played Furnace Fest, we played, um, I think that was the only one, honestly. No, we played Furnace Fest. We played, uh, we played three shows in Indonesia, which were all festivals. Even though we were we're headlining all these, but headline Furnace Fest, headlining uh, three festivals in Indonesia. We headlined. Um, well, we didn't headline uh, when we were young. That that would be Blink One Eighty Two and, and Green Day headline that. But we did well. We did well. <laughs> uh, but uh, so that was the only festival show we didn't have a headlining spot. Even before the album came out this in the summer of 2023, we played Festivois in French Canada up in Quebec. And uh, we headlined that. All great shows, everything. But I feel like, you know, as we do that, uh, we, 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 we ended up headlining Mexico City, which was a festival. Sum 41 was supposed to be the headliner. They dropped off a couple days ahead. They dropped off a whole week ahead almost. Like... They couldn't get their gear in there in time, but they had a week to figure something out, but they still didn't, they didn't show up. So for whatever the reason they didn't show up, we're like, we got your backs, buds, you know, cause we know those guys, I'm sure they had a decent reason to, to cancel again in Mexico. So we do our very best never to cancel. It has to be like, even if I have no voice, I'm going to show up and talk to everyone. And I don't know. Um, Actually, one time I canceled No Voice. I was deathly ill, and that was the garage in in London, uh, London, England. And it was our first headlining show we had ever sold out. 
had to cancel it. It ruined our career in the UK. I mean, after that, we didn't do well. <laughs> so if people wonder why we don't do well in the UK, it was because we were doing great. And I had to cancel basically a, a couple shows, including that sold out show at the garage. Um, we were touring Europe with less than Jake at the time. It was us and them kind of co-headlining and, and then in England we were going to, we opened for them and, and we did, we did an opening slot, but then <clears throat> we had, after the tour, we had some shows booked in England, headlining shows. And that's where I had to cancel. And it was the worst because it ruined, it ruined everything for us in, in England. I'm sure we could have turned it around, but it just never really did. Um, we do good now. I mean, we, our shows there in England, in London now, right now, if we did a show would be great. I feel would we could do, I don't know, a couple thousand people probably, maybe maybe fifteen hundred, but that's the thing is like there's there's other bands like Bowling for Soup over there is doing huge numbers, so you know a normal venue over there for us is kind of like eh, but like I said, uh, coming back to the tour part of it and you know starting in Seattle, so when, once we <laughs> a little random. Uh, once we got to had the headlining shows, like doing club shows where we have a longer set because we're headlining at these festivals, but you don't have all the time in the world at a festival. It's a finite time. Like, okay, here's your slot. Even though it's last, this is your slot. Even green day has a certain amount of time that they have to play headlining. So we didn't, you know, we didn't play our full set until Seattle In Seattle. Boom. We bust out our full headlining set and every night is different every night every show we change it up a little bit we keep a shell of what it is um because you know for each sort of you know, we have a lighting we have a lighting plot we have a stage plot that we like to stick by we have a backdrop we have you know all these things that are they look a certain way every show for this tour for this show you know this season i guess you could say um and you know with with headlining and putting it all together you know you don't want to necessarily it depends on your the band you are because certain bands that don't have like lighting and all that you can you can pretty much wing it and change the set completely now we change a lot of songs within the set um but we kind of you know, we do a few things that anchor the lighting situation, like this happens and then this happens. And, um, you know, I don't want to get too inside baseball for you guys, but, you know, when you mentioned stage presence and, you know, crowd interaction, and you know, that's just part of, of the type of show that we do. You know, not everybody does the type of show that we do, which is very energetic, very interactive with the crowd. Um, I don't think it's overkill. Like we're not doing breakdowns and woes every other song, but we do it just enough to where I feel like it's just got a nice flow to it. But you can also get a good a good rhythm to the songs. So the song, you know, each song that goes from this to this to this, it really should have a rhythm to it. And so when you do change up your set list, you still have to keep the rhythm of the set in mind. And I think everybody has a bet, much better time. And it's not something you have to think about when you're at the show. Just just enjoy the show. It's something that we think about pre-show. You know, we think about when we're planning. And so uh, part of what makes the show go really well is Tom Wisniewski, our guitar player. Uh, he he kind of leads this, but we all do this as a group. You know, Tom, Chris, I, uh, with Yuri. And, and Yuri's the main one because, you know, Yuri kind of like... Yuri and Tom really uh, start the, a lot of the songs. Like it either starts with guitar or it starts with drums. It rarely starts with bass. Chick Magnet, of course, starts with bass. A couple other songs do. Um, there's a few songs that Chris might start. But for the most par part, it's Tom starting or it's Yuri starting. And they start in different ways and we switch it up to where it really feels cool. But um, So we do this thing backstage before the show. We take our set list <clears throat> because, like I said, you know, we do change some of the set list. So there's different songs. So we had we visualize each each night what we're going to do. And so it's kind of like um, getting together with your team 
and going over some of the key plays that you're going to do. Now, we already know all the songs. Those songs are plays, so we have all these plays in the playbook. But then we have how we go from one song to the next, how we, what, when I talk and when I don't talk. And that's not always planned, but sometimes it is. And what I say is almost never planned, but sometimes it is. So sometimes I think about it. Sometimes I just have an idea of, I just want people to get in the pit for this part. You know, I want, I want the pit to go crazy. And, and then I just have that in mind and I'll just say that in some way. Um, that way it stays fresh. I'm not repeating one-liners or I'm not repeating jokes. I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm using the set list as a song, you know, the song list, the transition ideas, the talking points. It's purely, it's purely something to get us through the show without getting bogged down into one area or the next. I know that, you know, for a punk band, for a punk show, we want to be, we don't want to be talking for 15 minutes and then going to the next song. Like somebody does that. There are bands that do that, but not us. Like we will talk plenty. I feel like we talk enough to where people feel personable about it. I, I always, you know, take my own show going experiences and put them into my own shows because when I went and saw Bob Dylan in Seattle years ago, many, many years ago, this is, this is probably early 2000s, somewhere in there. Maybe it was even late 90s. But, I mean, it would be easy to look up because he hasn't been to Seattle very often. Um, I saw him at the Key Arena, nosebleed section, and it sounded good. It sounded decent. But I couldn't recognize almost any song until maybe we got into, like, the lyrics of, like, the chorus of, you know, don't think twice, it's all right. And the reason why I couldn't recognize the songs is because he was singing so dragged out of time. He was singing the melodies so different from the way we are used to hearing them on the records that I, I honestly didn't know this. And I, I knew and still know a lot of Bob Dylan songs. Like, I, I'm a fan. I, I know his records. Now, I don't know every single Bob Dylan song, but like I know every single bigger Bob Dylan song, and I know a bunch of demos. And I know, I mean, I've listened to, like, just hours and hours of Bob Dylan in my, in my lifetime. I've got some Bob Dylan time under my belt. And um, I couldn't recognize these songs, and I'm just like... What am, what is going on here? Like, am I, am I, are he, is he playing like the deepest tracks that I just don't know? And it was just, he's changing the melodies and he's changing the timing. And, and I think it's great to do that a little bit, to do something that's a little bit different than the record that shows that you can sing. It shows that you have an energy that's live. Like that's something that makes sense to me. And I do that. I do that. And, and and I know that is and I know that you don't want to do that too much. Because of my experience watching Bob Dylan, I I make sure that when I'm going off and doing things that are different from the album, I'm not doing the whole song different. I'm just doing key points that I like maybe like better now. So I'll sing as close as I can to the way it was and I'll change the things that I think could be better. That's it. And, and if it's a really key melody, I, I think it's important to do it close to the record so that people really can feel those vibes. You know, it's it's these melodies will will tap into your memories. They'll tap into your nostalgia. Um, and, and I didn't get that from the Bob Dylan show. And, and I'm a huge fan. So he also and this is another thing. He, I think he said two words to us in Seattle, two words like he said. Thank you one time and it was like five songs in and then they played a bunch more you know played a bunch more songs and i think he maybe introduced one song as like this one's called you know whatever right boy named sue he didn't play that one but i don't think that's his song that's his johnny cash song <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh well johnny and 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 uh, uh, Bob were were good friends, and they traded songs together, and they covered each other's songs. So, anyway, um, and and 
Bob D- Bob Dylan wrote "Don't Think Twice," but but Johnny Cash covered it, and it sounded great. It sounded really cool the way he did it. So uh, I think because I said "Don't Think Twice" earlier, I said another Johnny Cash song instead of a Bob Dylan song. Yeah, times are changing. That's probably my favorite Bob Dylan song. I I learned that on guitar and uh, memorized the, the lyrics. At one point, I don't know if I still know it, but I, I knew it. I knew it years and years ago. Um, thanks for the call. Appreciate it, Steve. All right, let's let's move on. Um, let's move on. Let's get to the next voicemail. Greetings, Mike. This is Michael again, and I wanted to say thanks for answering my question about critical feedback. I do have another songwriting question for you. When you're sitting down with a batch of songs that you've written and you're deciding which ones will go on to the next LP, how do you come up with the last one? In asking this, I did want to mention that I definitely think That's Life is one of the top five songs that you've written, mainly because of the extraordinary sense of finality that it has. I also feel that mistakes will be made, and this weekend are also definitely up there. A lot of my favorite songs are like that, with a few examples being Oh Sweet Nothing by The Velvet Underground, Blood Flowers by The Cure, or Judas Skin by the Vigilantes of Love. And occasionally, I'll hear one that somehow didn't end up being the last one on the record, but that meets that criteria anyway, like Shine a Light by Spiritualized or Ride On by ACDC. When you're writing songs, for something to have a sense of finality to it and to really feel like it's the last word on the themes that the record has explored, do you have to deliberately set out to write a song like that? Or is it more something that happens spontaneously as you're working on the entire batch? Is the process of writing it different? Or is it more of a case of coming up with an entire batch, looking at each one individually, and then deciding where it goes uh, in the ordering based on how it feels to you? Anyway, I'm glad that the New York and Philly shows went well and just wanted to say good luck with Atlanta and Orlando if this message airs before that trip. Thank you for taking the time to answer our questions, and please take care. Dude, I love how you wrote out your your question. Thank you, Michael. It was great. So many questions within a big question. So I think I'll just talk about I'll talk about it and hopefully I answer those details within the conversation. So thanks for calling in. Um, So the big, the big question is how to decide what albums end up on an album and how, how it all kind of gets put together. Do you, for, for a song like that's live mistakes will be made this weekend. Those are, those are, well, this weekend and mistakes will be made are our last songs on, on those respective albums. How do we come up with those? So I'll just start right there, and then I'll kind of work my way back, if that's cool. Um, With a song like Mistakes Will Be Made, with a song like That's Life, This uh, This Weekend, those were songs that I just wrote. They weren't written for the end of an album. But I, I specifically remember the song Moments Like This. Hopefully you know that song as well. Um, moments like this is a song that I cried while I wrote I, when I was writing the lyrics, I started crying because it was so emotional to think about what I was writing to, to realize how life really is good. How, how, yes, we struggle, the, we, but when I really think about the things that I've done and the things that the people that love me and <clears throat> the experiences and relationships that I have, life is good. And moments like this was a song that, that really it brought it all those feelings out. And a song like mistakes will be made ended up last on the record. It just feels like the last song. It, it's always going to be a song like that. But for me, it's like kind of like mistakes will be made was a vignette of, of good times, great times, but also some bad, like bad times that you kind of remember as good times. You know, when you're poor and hungry and starving and you're working this crap job, uh, but you get out of that someday, you remember those, those memories fondly. Like I remember touring in the van, waking up in, in parking lots. We still, it still happens sometimes, you know, depending on the travel situation. But, uh, but uh, you know, doing that day in, day out as a daily life thing, I'm not doing that anymore. You know, I'm, I'm, we fly into shows, we have hotels, and and we do travel on the road, but it's usually a couple days and we're good. So, but like we were doing this day in, day out, eating at Taco Bell for breakfast 
which is also why I put on those pounds after high school. Um, but I, I, uh, I just realized, you know, it, writing, you know, something like mistakes will be made, you know, life is really good. And I realized that every time I'm writing some of these songs that have these, these subjects that have a finality to life, because it's sad that we're all going to die. It's sad that our loved ones will die and have died and are dying. Um, but I, what, you, what can you do about that? And the, I mean, you can do some, sometimes you can do something about it. You can eat healthier. You can, you can make better choices. Um, and I'm not trying to turn this into a, a healthy habits podcast. Uh, but, but just, you know, the finality of life is sad. It's sad to realize, yeah, we're all going to die. We're all gone. Or, you know, a hundred years, no one we know will remember, will, no one we know will be here and, um, and no one will really remember us. Sure. They might have our names in a book or on a computer or pictures and videos and things like that. But like, what does that matter to us? We, we don't know anything about it. We can't, we can't enjoy that when we're gone. I mean, sure, if there is an afterlife, because there might be, we're going to be on to other things, right? Like, if there's an afterlife, we're going to be doing something else. Like, we're not going to be, sure, maybe we will see some loved ones some someday. Maybe, maybe that all exists in chemical reaction when you die, and it's happening in a split second. If you haven't seen the movie Jacob's Ladder, it's a thriller. It's a little scary, but it's, it's, it's this post-Vietnam war era thriller of a movie and it's really good and and it's just i'm not gonna say anything more <laughs> i'll spoil it but uh it's pretty old movie so if you haven't seen it whatever uh but what i'm trying to say is it's possible that we have an afterlife but it's also just in a split second you know how your life flashes before your eyes before you die they say that could be <clears throat> what happens we could live a whole nother maybe right now we're all living an afterlife i don't think so i think this is like our our big thing but you know if if the simulation is real or if some sort of simulation is is where we're actually at right now and we're like plugged in and feeding the aliens i don't think that's true at all i'm not i love conspiracy theories but i don't think I don't think a lot of the wild ones are actually true. Um, but it's, but you know, that's the thing is things are possible. It's possible. So um, looking at songs and, and pulling out those, those, um, those finite ideas, it, it can be sad, but I really try, I try to, to take those sad ideas and pull out the happiness, the happiness scale goes up and, you know, because the fact is, is there's always something you can complain about. There's always something you can complain about. But on the verse, on the other side, there's always something you can find, despite what's going wrong in your life, something positive going on. And I try to focus on those. So when I come up with an idea that's negative for a song, I try to find some pin of light. And that pin of light is enough to open up wider, wider and wider as we go. And that's why that's when I do that, when I can successfully write a song that I feel not only makes me cry because it, I'm so sad, <laughs> but also makes me cry from happiness. That is, that's my goal. That's what I'm trying to do. So I'm not trying to write a song for the end of the record. I got to need something for the end of the record. It's not how I do it. I'm just writing songs. And sure, there are times when I go, okay, I already have a lot of songs that are like mid-tempo, uh, this style, MXPX songs. I need another style of MXPX songs. Sometimes I'll do that where I'll try to push myself to write in my other, you know, this type of song that we do or or whatever. But, but I'm never... I'm never really writing for this is the last song on the record. This is the first song on the record. Now, whenever I write a great song, what, what I feel like is a great song, I feel like, oh, this should be the first song on the record. That's what happened with Anywhere But Here on Poconaccia. 
our first album. That should not have been the first song, and it's okay that it is. But the reason why it's the first song is because it was the last song we recorded and the last song I wrote for the album. <laughs> so we were so into it. We're like, this is so great because it was new to us. And that ended up first on the record. So I, I try not to, I try not to decide what's good and what's not based on when it was written. So there are songs that I'll like have written a year ago, two years ago. There's, there's gotta be a song or two that I've written seven years ago that are it's still a good song that I just haven't quite finished. Maybe the lyrics aren't done. Maybe it's, there's something about it. The chorus isn't there. And so I just have, whatever, right? I can take an idea. Like if I'm going to write a new song right now, I'll take, I'll either have the idea for the song and I'll start writing it. But if I'm like, no, I have, I have no idea, no specific idea, but I have some time right now. I'm going to sit down and write. I will go to my phone and I'll just scroll down the ideas. Some of them are, like I said, a couple years old. I never finished. Some of them are from last week. Some are from yesterday. So I'm just, you know, just take the idea, find one, find one that's like, just excites you. Something that's like, this is cool. This has to be a song. You, you know, that's what I do. And, and, and you'll work on it for a while. And sometimes you change your mind. You're like, this doesn't have to be a song. I realize this is this is weird or this just, yeah, there's just something not, I don't like about it. So like I'll start writing something and then I'll put it down and I'll start writing something else. So all the time I'll have songs written in various, various uh, levels of completion, but stages of completion. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how we do it. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the most important thing is having having the idea to write a song, not write a song for the record. So for me, I'm like, I, I want to write MXPX songs. And some of these songs might end up being on our next album. Some of them might be the, our next single that never ends up on an album. So like, that's not something you really decide. It just, it's timing. It's timing of when you happen to write this song and when we need a new song to release. So like management's like, yeah, we should probably release a new song blah, 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 you start writing a song or you have a song or, you know, whatever it is, you have a song ready, you, you pick the song that's makes sense, makes sense at the time. And, um, and I, I don't try to over plan all that stuff. I don't because I think everything, it, I mean, it's like this, you know, if, if the simulation is real or if, if timelines and, dimensions are are real and so there's different versions of us doing the same things but just a little different well this version you know i'm gonna have this thing happen you know these songs are gonna this is gonna be a single like on a in another timeline can't keep waiting might have been on find a way home you know we've included on the album you know a lot of bands will release songs a whole year or two before all those songs end up on a, co a collection of songs an album of songs so i mean it's not out of the question that we we would put it on that the the new album but we didn't because you know enough time had passed we had we had given we had had this moment for can't keep waiting and now we have all this these new songs and so we didn't feel the need to include that old single and so like yeah it, honestly like sometimes a song that would be great on an album ends up being a single and never ends up on an album and doesn't get the attention that it would get if it was on an album. And that's not to say that all songs on an album get attention because only really the first three or four do, unless you have some really strong songs like stay up all night is song seven, I think on uh, the album. And it's the, the one with the most numbers. Second place is song number one, track number one, not today. So it starts, stay up all night, not today. And then it goes from there. This is what you told me. And then I assume it just goes from there in order. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I think that's it. Um, who knows? The timing is, uh, it's something that I embrace, you know, I, you know, timing is everything, but it, you don't have to plan everything, uh, to a T because things are going to change. And, you know, 
I can't control how I write and what I write. And I try not to, in fact, I try to just write from the heart and, and, uh, and that's, that's why, <laughs> that's why I was crying on, on, uh, moments like this. Cause, cause it was that real. It really was. All right. Great question. Loved it. I appreciate it, Michael. Thanks for writing out your, your question too. That was cool. Let's get to the next voicemail. Hey, Mike. This is Kanan from North Jersey. Um, long time, fairly long time, long time MXPX fan. I saw you guys first at, um, Warp Tour in 1998, Asbury Park, and then again, like, maybe the year 2000 with you guys, uh, played with the Hippos at Starland Ballroom. It used to be called Hunka Bunka Ballroom. Anyway, um, it's been a long time, but we were able to finally go see you again back, uh, on February 9th at Webster Hall. My wife and my son Elijah and I went to go see you guys. He's been, he's eight. He's been listening to you guys now for three, four years. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. He had the night of his life, as did I. You guys just get better with age and time. Um, you guys crushed it out there. Really love to hear you play all the uh, old songs as well as the new songs. And I just think it's absolutely incredible how embracing and um, encouraging you guys are of young young fans. Uh, it was really cool to see all the young kids out there, multi-generational punk rock show. Um, Eli was able to crowd surf a little bit. He met you guys at the end. Uh, we were there with my cousin, Seth and Christina. Um, we just had a blast. And um just wanted to thank you for doing what you do. Keep rocking. Bye. That's rad. Very cool, very cool. You know what's funny? Thanks for calling. Um, and thanks for coming out again. Uh, I love I love seeing the generations, and I love seeing people that haven't been around for a little while coming out and seeing us again. So you mentioned Hunka Bunka, which is now Starland Ballroom. And um, Goldfinger played there a couple years ago, a couple times. And uh, I ripped my pants. I ripped my pants. In fact, you know what's funny? This is so wild, but I ripped my pants, and these are the pants. I'm gonna. If you're on YouTube, you can see this. But now you're not really gonna see the detail of it because it's blurred out. But but those are the pants that I ripped at Starland Ballroom playing for Goldfinger. This was years ago at like Skanksgiving. Uh, in November, it was uh, kind of an annual, almost annual thing that they do. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, I think back then, way back then, it was Real Big Fish, Goldfinger, and, you know, who, whoever else. But but I ripped my pants, I, I fell off the side of the stage into the monitor cables. Like, not on the monitor board, but in between the monitor board and the stage, there was all these cables, like a hammock. I fell right in there and I couldn't get out. It was like a spider's nest. I was like trying to get out and I had my base on still. And by the time I got off, I looked down, my pants were ripped. What, what, how does that happen? Um, and I put a patch on it, you know, when I got home and, uh, and the rest is history. So I still have the pants. I don't wear them that often because of the patch. Cause I'm like, I don't really want a patch on my pants, but, but I still have them. Those are the ones, the, the, the Starland Ballroom. And Hunka Bunka is what it used to be called. And MXPX played there, like you said, with the hippos. And I'm pretty sure that that, that show was where we did the photo shoot for at the show. So when you see, so at the show is our live, our first live album. And on the inside, all the photos you see, I, I'm where I'm, I'm holding a, a giant mirror ball. I'm like about to throw it or something like that. That, I think that's in the artwork. If not, that was an outtake photo, but that, that photo does exist. Um, that was at Hunka Bunka. It was, there was like this room full of junk and we just went in there and did a photo shoot. And then the, the live photos are from that night. So the live photos, from at the show or not from the shows that we recorded the show. <laughs> I don't think anyway. I mean, there might, the cover might be, but, but the rest of them aren't. Um, wild, 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 wild. All right. Thanks, Kanan. Appreciate it. Let's get to, let's get to our next. So our next, um, our next call is from Bill from Rockport uh, or Brockport. Um, anyway, he called in three times because he kept, he got cut off. And so he called in again. So, just understand, we're going to have one caller, but he's called in three times. No problem. We'll make it happen. Here we go. 
Here's Bill. Wait. I just said all that. Okay, yeah, here's Bill. Here we go. Hey, Mike, it's Bill from Brockport calling back in. First and foremost, Philadelphia was fucking amazing. was so stoked to get to see you guys in concert, enjoy the whole experience. Thank you guys for sticking around as late as you did after the show, because believe me when I say I was the very last person in the line to meet you guys. And me and my girlfriend had a phenomenal time. It was her first time at an actual punk show, standing room only type of deal. The crew was amazing. The venue staff was beyond amazing and patient with people. It wasn't like a lot of shows where they were pushing you out of the venue hall as soon as the sound stopped or anything. They let us hang out by the bathrooms at the back of the venue by the bar and just sit on the steps. We were sitting there when you guys come out and I was showing my girlfriend pictures on my phone and completely missed it. So you guys were almost past. She said, what's up to Tom? It was just a really awesome experience. Got to see Tom and Yuri while we were in the line waiting to come in. Interacted with them. That was, it was just an all around amazing show. But the root of my call today is the Let's Rock album. Um, I know you've touched on it a little bit in the past from what I understand or remember slash have heard through grapevines over the years is it was more or less like a B sides album from Buffalo and the ever passing moment. Is that correct? Um, also side note, what brought this up is I was listening to one and three last night at work. And one of my coworkers was listening to it in the heavier bridge slash breakdown area and he's like, is he, is he saying affluenza? Like, um, I think so. But honestly, I've never looked it up to be a hundred percent sure. Pulled up the lyrics on Spotify and they, they are beyond all whacked out. Um, like for sweet, sweet thing, which is one of my favorite songs off the album. It's just a solid song that really hits the feels with a punk kid growing up when I did. It has the first line is, Time to lead a farmer's life and then continues on with stuff that is definitely not that song. Um, overall, it's one of my favorite albums. I wouldn't rank it like top five overall, but I don't know. It always had the vibe of like a kind of like a mixtape or a burnt CD one of your friends gives you to you. It's, it's kind of all over the place, but in a good way. Like there's not a bad song on the album. And that's kind of what I love about it. And uh, was a little bummed when the box set came out that that wasn't included in it. Any chance we can ever get even just a small little run of it? Oh, you got cut off. Let's go to the next one. Yo, Mike, Bill from Rockport calling back. Hit the three-minute limit. Um, that was pretty much it for the Let's Rock album stuff. Just wanted to say again, thank you for everything. All right, I'm going to pause you there. Let's get to the Let's Rock stuff. Now, you asked, by the way, thank you for Philly. Thank, great show review. I love how you give the detail on, on your experience there. People love that. I love that. And it's cool to hear because we really do care about the showgoers' experience. We want not just our set to go well. We want your whole night to feel good, you know? It's all part of the same thing, you know? We want you to enjoy the opening bands. We want you to not have people kicking you right out after we're done. Like, all right, get out of here, losers. So that, that really means a lot to us. Thank you. And thanks, Bill. Thanks to your girlfriend as well. Um, okay, so for one, let me just say the lyrics thing on any lyrics, they're going to be wrong. Like, they're not always going to be wrong, but a lot of lyrics are wrong when you look them up online. I think it's just, it's hard for these bots, when they listen to the lyric, they listen to the actual mix of the song and they're trying to code these lyrics, they get it wrong. It's just straight up. It's just, but yes, I do say affluenza on that, that song one and three. Now about let's rock B sides. They are B sides, but they're not, they're not B sides from Buffalo and the Everpassing Moment, they're just B-sides in general. There's a couple 
because there's like one or two songs from the ever passing moment maybe something from buffalo maybe definitely stuff from the panic era so i it's really just a general b-sides album um and the reason why we did it was <laughs> to fulfill some uh contractual stuff but hey it's kind of fun too i really love that song one and three it's one of my favorites um even the songs that are kind of just like a little more like okay this is like pop rock ballad stuff um that really slow one my heart still hurts is it called <sighs> man that's just me indulging my songwriting and just as an artist wanting people to hear it but honestly i probably shouldn't we shouldn't have released some of those songs um not that i don't think they're good but i just don't think they fit mxpx as well um but you know i've always i've always really enjoyed just <laughs> writing songs I, I enjoy so many different genres of music you know it's hard to just choose punk rock only sometimes but but hey you know um as for let's rock being pressed on vinyl ah who knows maybe we'll do it sometime we wanted we wanted to for the box set we wanted to do just our main albums because if we did eps and things like that it's like that would get crazy we could do a whole separate thing maybe but that would also be hard to do because uh side one dummy owns the rights to let's rock universal owns the rights to most of our old catalog and and then we own all the new stuff but we made it happen the first time we could make it happen again you never know you never know but i appreciate your call uh let's let's continue your call bill all right here we go new album still phenomenal still 10 out of 10 in my book it's it's battling for number one mxpx song for me still it, it's holding on but man it, it's it's so damn good and uh any chance we can ever get a cassette release i know someone else has called in and asked I'm big into old school media. I don't have Bluetooth or any shit like that in my car. I've, I rock CDs and that's pretty much it. CDs, cassettes. Um, maybe that would be really cool someday. And also find a way home CD. We're going to get them back in the merch store. I kind of regret not picking up a second one at the show now simply because I was showing my buddy the album. I was giving him a ride after work. He was having his car at the shop, and he rode with me. I was showing it to him. He's like, this is really, really good. Like, I really like this. I'm like, hey, man, just take the C. I'll just order another one. Not a problem. Like, get it out there. Get it get it in circulation. I, I just can't bring myself to drag my signed copy into the car and have it get all muffed up over time. So if we can get them restocked, that would be fucking dope, too. Thank you again for everything you do. Much appreciated. Again, thank you guys for sticking around as long as you did at Philly. I think we didn't get out of the venue and back to the hotel till quarter after 12, and we weren't far from the venue. That was super rad that you guys stuck around that long. Genuinely took the time to meet everyone. Got to say hey to you, introduce myself as Bill from the podcast. Got some compliments from Tom about my PXPX tattoo on my neck. It was just, again, best experience, best concert experience. Thank you again. Much love. Take it easy, man. Rad. Dude, so I appreciate it again. And uh, the CDs. I thought we had them restocked. I would check back again by now. I mean, you did call in. This was a little while ago because these voicemails stack up. But, uh, yes, I I would check MXPX.com right now and see if we got CDs because I think we do. And if we don't, well, consider yourself... Uh, the squeaky wheel, and I'm going to get you some oil. We'll make that happen, okay? Now, cassettes, like I said earlier, uh, someday we might do it. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. It might be fun. Uh, you called in right away and left one more voicemail. It's a short one. I haven't listened to it, but I'm going to go ahead and play it for you, Bill, because, uh, you know, you're my star pupil right now. Hey, Mike, it's Bill from Brockport calling back in again three in a row. Let's fucking go. Um, just quick question. The bass toss you guys do on the stage, how many times has that gone horribly wrong? What were some of the best stories and worst stories you have on 
the base tosses because as a fan, it is something absolutely epic that I've been looking forward to seeing in person for so long. Just wanted some history on that. Thanks again. Love you. Have a good one, man. All right. Yeah, I think it was 1999 or 2000, somewhere in there, Warp Tour, and we were in Toronto, Canada, at at Barrie, Barrie, Can- Barrie Ontario, um, where Warp Tour used to be oh, so many years. And I just had the idea. I was like, you know what? I, I think I want to... You know, you know what it, what it was is we're on Warp Tour. We're pretty new. You know, it was we're still doing great. By the way, we're 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 bigger coming up as a big band. Like by the two thousand, yeah, we we're we're doing really well. Um, so I I was getting all these bases, but from Ernie Ball, and I'm like, we have all these bases, and on Warp Tour, you have these guys being blown out of cannons, and you have motorcycle guys taking big jumps and just doing all these tricks and landing just going big and i'm just like let's just we should go big and at the time neil hunt was our our tech or my my base tech and i was like neil you want to throw some bases so we went back in back of the stage and this is in barry ontario and back of the stage was just like a grass field and there was cars and there was people and there was tents and stuff. But like we found an, an open area right behind the stage, pretty much um, past Guitar World and everything. So we weren't like in the middle of all that. And we just, we started, started throwing a bass back and forth with each other. And at first it was just one bass. I would throw it to him and he'd catch it or whatever. And, um, and then over the, you know, and we did that warp tour, you know, throw it, and he'd throw it, throw it to me. And uh, that's how it started with us. And then it just got bigger and bigger over the years. Um, and then James Barrett started catching it. And James Barrett was my, my bass tech for many years. And um, so he started catching it and throwing it. And we started doing the thing where it would be, cross it would, it would cross in the air and that is where i'll i mean backing up a little bit over the years i think we were on we were on tour with dashboard confessional and i i threw the bass at um at james and james over threw the bass to me and i tried i caught the bass but i ran into all these vintage, beautiful vintage amps for, uh, that that were dashboard confessionals, and it was their setup. And I was just like, "Oh shit!" Like just ruining their their backline because um, we were opening for we were main main support for them at the time. And um, I remember that was rough. And I like took out a bunch of amps, and it was like the tech ran over and was like picking it all up, and um, that was bad. Uh, one time I threw back in Neil's day, I, we were in San Diego with, I want to say the offspring. No, not the offspring. It was, I don't know what tour it was, but we were at this outdoor amphitheater tour and, um, it might've been simple plan. Um, us and simple plan, um, co-headlining anyway, playing the show. I throw my bass up to Neil and he's like going to catch it. And the lights, go off and he doesn't see it and it hits him on the head he still kind of catches it so it doesn't just hit him on the head because i would that would basically could kill him but he catches it but it still hits him and he was so pissed he was so mad i remember being i was i felt so bad um a couple other times i mean many times uh especially in the days of leprechauno I threw a few crazy. He dropped one. I dropped, uh, I would drop one now and again and it would just hit the ground and I'd pick it right up and start playing it. And if it was in tune, I would keep playing it. And if it wasn't, I would, uh, I would like, then I'd just throw it back to him and he'd give me a different one. So I, things like that would happen all the time. But nowadays we have uh, Johnny. He's our, he's our uh, monitor slash audio guy audio audio recorder but he also you know he also helps he's not our main he's not my main bass tech um that would be mark but but um 
but he does help out with a lot of the teching. So he does that part of it where he throws. And uh, we actually went out into into a, a park here next to the studio in, through the neighborhood. We went to this like soccer field and practiced with a couple of my old bases before we ever did it on a real stage. So we went bigger and higher than we, we have ever gone on a stage. We went bigger and higher in the field. It was so high that I was having trouble. I was throwing it as hard as I could, and, and, and it was crazy. But when it was coming in so fast that it would slam into my fingers, like, zoom. I had like indentations in my fingers. But, you know, most stages aren't that big. So we, we tightened it up a little bit, and, and now it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty fun. But, hey, anything could happen. You know, uh, a couple weeks, a couple months ago in, was it New York or Philly? One of those two, I think. Uh, I caught the base, but it was high. I had to jump and jump catch it. It was over my head. And I jumped up, caught it. And when I came down, I, I, I moved back. And Trey, our, our video guy, was right there. And he, it hit his camera. And his camera went back and hit. And the freaking thing flew off and, and uh, ruined his camera. It didn't ruin his camera, but it messed it up for like that show. And all that footage well, that was uh, Atlanta that that happened because all that footage, he had to like go through crazy f links to get some footage back. And he didn't get everything, but he got a bunch of stuff. Um, and it was because of that base toss. So it's craziness is still happening. Even in 2024, you never know what's going to happen. Come out and see us live. Um, I hope it never gets old. I'm sure people are like, ah, I'm so bored of the base toss. It's not even fun. Like, No, it's pretty fun. It's pretty cool to see. Um, but that's not all we do, folks. We do a lot more than just base tossing, okay? All right. Come out and see us. MXPeaks.com. <laughs> all right. Bill, you had your time. You had a lot of time. I appreciate you. Thanks for calling in. Continue doing so, all right? Here's uh, here's the next voicemail. Hi, Mike. This is Chad Hogue. Thanks so much for playing my band, Ford the Ripper, on episode 495. We've also been featured on Chris Can Make the Podcast, and I couldn't have possibly imagined this 25 years ago when I was spending days trying to figure out the baselines to Chick Magnet and History of a Boring Town. You guessed that we are from Canada based on our song title, Worst Case Ontario, but we actually just have fans of the TV show Trailer Park Boys. Actually, we're from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, former home of the dearly departed Chameleon Club. Oh, wow. I had described our sound as for fans of post-reunion Five Iron Frenzy, and you wanted to know what I meant by that. Buckle up, because I'm about to fansplain Ska to a member of Goldfinger. <laughs> okay. On the albums from their original run, almost every song had a guitar playing clean up strokes. On their newer albums, almost none of the songs do. We don't have many Ska rhythms in our songs either, and traditionalists can get pretty gatekeepy if you compare yourself to Ska bands while not actually playing Ska. I've been fortunate enough to get to see a lot of shows in my life, but somehow I'd never seen MXPX. Until this past weekend, when you came out to Union Transfer, that is. I'm so glad I finally made it out, and now I can't keep waiting until you come around again. That leads to my question. Do you intentionally have the guitars hard panned in the PA? I was up front by Chris and could barely hear Tom's guitar all night, even when he was the only person playing anything. It was interesting to be able to hear Chris's parts isolated, but not what I would think you would want for an average audience member. Again, thanks for playing our song. Thanks for coming out to Philly. Keep up the good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, thanks for calling, man. Can't keep waiting. Funny. Um, honestly, I don't know. That's weird. I don't think they're hard panned, but um, it might have just been where you were. It was a weird spot or something, because you should be able to hear kind of everything. Um no matter where you're at, uh, sometimes when you're like too up front, you can't hear the full spectrum of, of everything blending well. But but that's kind of interesting that that you notice that. Oh, interesting. Um, no one's ever mentioned that to me, so uh, I will I will run it up the flagpole. I'll I'll let somebody know that that could be an issue. But um, obviously, we want 
everybody's experience to be the absolute best experience. Um, dude, Trailer Park Boys. That's definitely why I thought you were from Canada. But yeah, Lancaster, Pennsylvania is fun. I uh, We had a lot of memories from the Chameleon Club. Um, I'm not sure what to think about the ska thing because... Must ska have upstrokes to be ska? What is the definition of ska? What makes ska ska? What makes skeet skeet? You know, I mean, questions we may never be able to answer. Um, <laughs> so ska without upstrike, uh, upstrokes, which I feel like when we, when, as, as a member of Goldfinger, it doesn't mean I know anything about ska, but we have ska songs and we have punk songs. So we are a ska punk band. And if we had one ska song and all the rest punk songs, I would not think that we would be called a ska punk band. We'd probably just be called a punk band. Maybe with one ska song. Um, so with no horns, there's, a, there's ska bands with no horns. With no upstrokes and no horns, can you be a ska band? Now that, that's my next question. What makes ska ska? I mean, without looking it up, without, I'm just from my top of my dome. I thought it was upstrokes. To be honest, I thought it was upstrokes. <laughs> I thought, you know, there, there's, there's a few things, you know, there's walking bass lines, but you don't have to do a walking bass line for every ska song that has upstrokes. You can do something different, but I'm going to ask John Feldman. I should probably call him, but I'm not going to. He's probably in a session right now. Ah, I don't know. We're going to leave this. We're going to leave this an open ended question. And I would love people to call in and give your opinion on what makes ska ska. What makes punk punk? Because there's a lot of punk bands that have a lot of pop influence and not as much punk, but they're still punk. They're still somewhat punk. So what makes punk punk? What makes ska ska? And can you play ska without upstrokes? Can you play ska without horns? I think the answer is yes to one of those, but is it yes to both? And how much does the walking bass lines and the drum patterns come into play must you play ska on drums with a piccolo snare that's my next question must you play with a piccolo snare or can you play with a deep deep snare like a tom or something now i don't know i don't know i i hope you can play ska without a piccolo snare because i kind of hate those things <laughs> that was the one thing i didn't like about that goldfinger uh, record self-titled it, it the pickle bing 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 here in your bedroom bing 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 did not like that but that's you know that's a criticism that i'm going to go ahead and 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 say that it also made that album and those songs at the time stand out a lot from what else we were hearing because the, those songs came out or you know here in your bedroom was the first song i heard on from them Goldfinger, my band that I'm in, not my band, but you, you get it. Uh, first song I heard on M MTV was Here in Your Bedroom. And I remember I was like, I love this song, but I really don't like that snare. It's so weird. Who's that drummer, Darren? Okay, Darren Pfeiffer, nice drum sound. I know it wasn't necessarily his fault, but but uh, let's blame Darren. We're gonna blame Darren. All right, <laughs> now we got Darren, we got Darren Beef. No, we don't. We love Darren, but if we if, if should should I start a beef with Darren? Probably not Darren because there's there's bigger artists that I could start beef with. But but thinking of the Kendrick Lamar Drake beef and why those things happen, why beef happens, it, it is funny because you know I don't know if those two were ever friends, but there's been beef between like Kanye and Drake where those two were friends and then they're enemies. But then they're friends again, and they're at Coachella, and they're hanging out. But then they're they're enemies again. You know, like this just must be part of the culture that I don't understand. Um, but it's good for 
it's good for the narrative. It's good for the drama. It's good to, for, for the, for the community to talk, you know, cause people love to talk and they love to have an, a, a, you know, a storyline, a through line that's not just music. And, and I really believe that's why <laughs> a lot of these things happen. These beefs happen. So I'm all for it. Obviously I'm joking a little bit about the beef. You know, I, I, people wouldn't believe it if I was mad at somebody, if I was like, I got beef with Darren because of his drum sound, <laughs> his piccolo drum. No, I mean, who cares, right? Like it's stupid, but, but, uh, I don't know. I think I answered that question. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do a couple more. Hey, Mike, this is Derek out here in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, it's a couple weeks past the Super Bowl, as I'm calling, and, uh, you know, my nine-year-old is starting to get into football real big. And uh, so uh, I told him that uh, you all did a Super Bowl commercial one time. So I'd love to hear the uh, story behind that. He, that was really cool. Uh, you know, just how, how did that come about? I know you guys did some, you know, a Mountain Dew commercial, which I, you know, taped off the radio one time. Uh, you know, some other things, Pepsi Mountain Dew. How did that come about? The sponsorship? How did the, the Super Bowl thing come about? Because uh, I think that makes for some entertaining radio. All right, thanks. All right, Derek. Let's talk Super Bowl. Um, well, the Super Bowl was, was funny because that was the year, what was that year? Like 2007, 2008. No, am I thinking wrong? But all I know is before everything and after was was recorded, not released yet, and we were doing all our promo for the new album. And the label was looking for opportunities. Our management was looking for opportunities at the time. That was Creighton Burke. And I don't know, Creighton brought us this commercial. And he's like, hey, I got you guys a Pepsi, a Diet Pepsi commercial. And they're slotting this thing for the Super Bowl. And so we're like, what? All right, this is kind of amazing, all right? And they're going to pay you for it. They're going to pay you a bunch of money to be in this commercial. So we uh, we had Dave Jordan, who had produced our album. Uh, we went in and, and had him make a a live version of Well Adjusted. So we took we took Well Adjusted and added reverb and crowd noise to it. Um, in a way, maybe not even crowd noise, because I think they added the crowd noise in the commercial post. So we just made it sound more like live and sloppy, and and um, they use that. So it's not the album version that you hear on the commercial. It's a it's like a, a remixed version of Well Adjusted, and Well Adjusted for for all intents and purposes was the single that was going to be our first single, and. We flew down to LA, we stayed in Hollywood, we stayed at, at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills or what, whatever the one near, near Beverly Hills is. Uh, w the one and only time we've ever stayed there. And we had whatever we wanted at Four Seasons, whatever you need, just call, make it happen. And we're like, oh, well, we, you know, we, we just wanna go, go out for the night because it was the next day we were gonna film. And um, we just had the night off. So they got us a limo. They're just like, all right, we have a car for you. You can just use it all night. And then when you're done, they'll take you back to the hotel and and go or whatever. No problem. We're paying for it. And um, so we, we go down. And as I'm, as I'm going, we go down the lobby and LL Cool J is in the lobby. I was like, is this normal for, you know? these swanky hotels or whatever, you know, cause we're just kids. Like th think of us, we're just, we were, we technically adults. We were in our twenties, early twenties, but still I, I really consider myself a kid. And so we were just kind of seeing things for, for what it is, you know, just like another celebrity, you know? And so we get in the, we get in the, uh, in the limo and we just go to all these bars and clubs and, we just go crazy and we just were out all night. And luckily young was not hung over the next day, showed up the next day in this huge field. They had built this giant stage and they had 
so many extras and they're hosing all these extras down with mud. I remember like t- talking to a lot of the extras and there was a bunch of fans of MXPX and people that knew who we were and they were stoked to be there. I wonder if there's anybody listening to this podcast that was actually in that commercial because there were so many extras. It was, it was really fun. So we got up on this stage. They had this giant plastic banner that was definitely not a travel size banner. It was way bigger and way heavier than your average banner. I'm pretty sure that uh, Marie from the fan club bought that banner and still has it in Texas. I don't know how she like, it's in a big box. You have to like ship it in a box, but um, well, most banners are in boxes, but this was a big box. Um, Anyway, we're just, we're on this giant stage and we have all our equipment set up. It's not even our equipment. We're using, you know, we're just using rental gear. And, um, and we just start doing takes, you know, just and we're just playing to us doing playback and making, for better or worse, basically a music video is what we were doing. We, we shot it like a music video and then they shot their scenes with us doing our stuff. And uh, it really was a fun day. It was a one day shoot done and uh, the, the, the Super Bowl commercial came out and everybody saw it. So many people saw it. Everybody was calling me. Everybody was talking about it. Um, that was huge. It was huge. And for a long time, I would tell people one of the coolest things we've ever done was be on the Super Bowl commercial. Um, nowadays, I you know, there's there's newer things, but but I'll never forget it. So thanks for bringing it up. All right, fun. Can't wait for football to come back. Dang. All right, last one. Thank you all for calling in. I appreciate it. Here we go. Hey, Mike. My name's JD. Morning. This might be a little long one, but uh, hey, man, I just wanted to call in and catch for a long time, but it kind of comes and goes. And heard you were taking voicemails. and thought that was a cool idea. So, anyways, I just wanted to call and tell you like how big of a low key influence you've been on me because like i've been listening i'm 36 i've been listening since i shoot probably 12 years old so i wow 12 to 36 but anyways dude like you're a little older than me but like man you got me into punk rock like i would take like the let it happen album in and be like i want my hair cut like this and show them a picture of you and like had older friends that were into you that like also influenced me but as I've grown up, you know, I've listened to the podcast, gone to shows, and, like, man, dude, a lot of, like, the way we believe has just, like, weirdly fallen in line, you know. Grew up Christian, still am, but, like, I don't think my parents would agree with the way I believe, and um, I just find comfort in, like, like-minded people, you know. I don't need an echo chamber, but, man, it's fun to listen to you and, just all the different takes you have. And, man, I appreciate what you, Tom, and Yuri have built and what you guys continue to build and you as a solo artist. And uh, just keep influencing us, man. I, I love it. It's a good, positive influence. Love you guys. Love MXPX. And uh, hope you and your family are healthy and happy. means a lot, JD. Appreciate it, man. I hope you're well. Dude, thanks for listening. 12 to 36. That's cool, man. Uh, what was I listening to when I was 12? Nothing this cool. Not not punk rock yet. I, w- I wasn't quite into punk rock. I was probably listening to Paula Abdul, MC Hammer. Uh, I mean, what is 12? 12 is like sixth grade, something like that, somewhere in there, seventh grade. I don't know, maybe six, fifth or sixth grade. Um, that's cool. Dude, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, honestly, I, I never even thought of it that way. And I still don't really think of it that way. Although I realize it now, especially because you called and just told me, but what I'm saying is realizing like back in the day when people would see my hair and be like, Oh, I'm going to do my hair like that. Or, um, or wear a jacket. I mean, I was, I wasn't doing the same thing exactly with hair, but, but like, style wise i wanted to look punk you know i got jackets from the thrift store and i put studs on the collars and you know i don't know if i was doing it right but i was just doing my thing and and i feel like you know passing that down to you and you you probably felt the same way you know you you were just doing your thing and you see something you kind of like you're like let's try that and and it ends up being 
being your version of that. And I think music is music and anything artistic, anything creative is, um, it's important to realize we, we, we really do get influenced by things, even if we don't realize it, even if we're not seeing it in our face every day, there's subconscious, there's, you know, you know, people, people, uh, talk about marketing and how you need to see something like nine times before you want to buy it. Like the, um, the Cadillac approach, you think they're thinking, okay, if we, let's put on an ad and this ad is going to sell so many cars. Like they put it on an ad. They're not thinking they're going to sell a car from that ad. They're thinking we're going to put this ad out and this kid is going to see this ad and they're going to see this car. And then next year they're going to see another ad, same car new ad and the next year you're going to see another ad same car same brand and they don't need a car they're not 16 they're not whatever years go by you get what i'm saying like finally i want a car i'm 16 i'm ready to buy my first car blah 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 why why is it that i want a cadillac so badly why is it that i want whatever it is that you've been seeing right so like that's the power of, of branding and marketing and, and seeing something over and over and over, it gets in your brain. So, you know, when you, when, when you get too much of something, when you're, when you're online too much and you're wondering why you feel discombobulated or why you feel stressed out or why you feel anxiety or, or whatever, it could just be a lot of these subconscious things that you're just seeing over and over and you're not realizing, you're not taking it in, but you are taking it in, right? <sighs> I'm glad you're taking it in something positive because honestly, I really, now that I do realize that people, people are influenced by everything they see, even if they're not trying to be, I try to be positive. I try to be real. Uh, I realize that, that um, all this stuff is, is going to be here and you may see this podcast two years, three years from now, or you may listen to this podcast two years from now, where uh, all our circumstances maybe have changed, but but this is still relevant. It's going to be relevant. You know, uh, social media ain't getting any, any, any more chill. Let's put it that way, right? So um, we need to be out there communicating, but but I think being real, being doing it in a real way, in a way that doesn't make people feel like they're going crazy. Like, like when you see only the best from somebody online, you see them working so hard all the time, doing the best, making tons of money, da, da, da. you see that and you're just like, man, I'm not, that's not me. I'm not making all this money. I'm not constantly being invited to all these parties and going to shopping and going to coffee with whatever. Like, yeah, nobody is. I mean, people are, but like, it's not real, you know, like, ah, I just want you to know that life and even the, even the boring parts of life are worth going through. They really are. Um, they may not be worth posting online. Like I don't want to see, you know, the same thing over and over and over again. But, but, um, but if it's something kind of interesting, I think the repetition of it is what makes it successful. So when you see people doing really well online, you probably look at all their social media and see that they have so many of whatever they're doing. Anyway, I think it's great. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. You, uh, you, really, uh, you really got me thinking about, about really paying attention to what I'm influencing a, a little bit more. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Derek. Um, all right, that's it. MXPeaks.com. Everything there supports what I do here, not only with the podcast, but MXPX and my solo art stuff. And uh, I appreciate you guys. So, so thank you. And I'll see you this summer. All right. All right. Peace out.